The biggest challenge for doing a book like this for me is that I knew nothing when I started. I didn't have any idea what the main questions were. I had no sense of what the goal of the book would be. I just knew that through the experience, I would learn about myself. But I didn't know how to sort of prioritize and say, okay, this is the most important thing, this is second most important. And in the end, um, I ended up putting things together in an organization that just kind of made sense. You know, start with cells, start with the little bits, and then say, okay, cells need energy. They need oxygen. They need water. They need to get rid of waste because these are all little working things. And you start, you realize that each of those things refers to a specific system, to the respiratory system, to the circulatory system that will carry the air that the, that the cells need to those cells and will bring the waste and, and get rid of it. And, and so we can exhale it. And then you need building materials because these cells are not, you know, uh, little clouds. They're actually made of real stuff. And you need proteins and you need all that sort of stuff that can, you, you can build proteins with. You need the energy source that will allow proteins to rearrange themselves and get torn apart and get put back together in different ways to accomplish different things. You can see how one system sort of builds on another. And that really is the structural idea behind the way we work. All the way through, at the very end, to reproduction and how you start all over again. Because at some point, this machine, as wonderful as it is, is going to run out of juice. It's just going to die. And you don't want the whole species to die. You would like to see it continue. And, and, and therefore, you have to sort of deal with the next step. So we begin with cells, we end with cells, and the continuity of life. I think my sense of humor is what keeps me going. I think no matter how difficult the day's work will be, I'm always ready for a laugh. I'm always ready for a surprise in the material. I'm always ready for something to emerge from the drawing pad as I'm scribbling away, thinking that I'm going in one direction, that I'm very carefully studying how cells attach to each other. Um, and then, you know, you suddenly realize that, you know, you're in a, a funny part of the body or you're, you're, you're just, or they have little personalities, which of course I get rid of immediately. I don't want cells with sneakers and little baseball caps. Um, but you're always looking for those elements that I think um, soften the science, humanize the, the information in, in a way that allows um, a broader audience of regular people like me to, you know, to sort of enjoy and absorb this material on whatever level they're capable of, whatever they bring to it. And because I use pictures and play within the pictures, I think there are different levels um, to be to be seen, to be read, to be understood. And it won't all happen at once. And maybe certain levels will be read by a 10-year-old a certain way and not fully understood until someone is 30 or 35 or 40. But uh, by the same token, there are things that will be noticed and appreciated by that 10 or 12-year-old that will never be noticed by the 35 or 40 or 50-year-old. So, uh, I mean, the real pleasure, I, I suppose, in a way, is being able to do this primarily visually. That's what I bring to this, whether, it's, whether we're talking about machinery, man-made machinery, or the machine that is man. Um, the visual opportunities and possibilities are just so inviting and so welcoming, so friendly, compared to that block of text and that little diagram, C figure A, and, and that sort of stuff. I, I depended on that kind of information, but then I pushed it aside and told my own story. When you're dealing with something as complicated as the human body, you're constantly looking for ways to simplify. And this book begins with cells. I mean, it begins with the tiniest little elements, of living organisms that become us. And that in itself is incredibly complicated, not necessarily because of the sort of technical aspects of how a cell works, but because you can't see them. And when you start to think of yourself as this compilation of countless, trillions, tens of trillions of invisible things. It's, you sort of think, how do I bring this stuff to life? And not settle for the traditional diagrams and, and those kinds of approaches, which, while successful at containing the information, may not be successful at getting anyone excited about the information. My challenge is always to not only present stuff accurately, but actually get you interested in it. Put a smile on your face, if I can, while you're reading about how cells work and how they interact and how they communicate and the roles they play and the different lifespans they have. 
I think the most difficult part of the way we work was the brain, the brain section. It's the longest section in the book. And because you can only draw the brain once or twice, and people say, well, that's the brain, we've got that covered, you have to find other ways of making this material, this information, come to life. And once again, when you're talking about axons and tiny little, tiny little things and bursts of electrical energy and impulses and so on and so forth, you know, there's no way to draw that stuff, really. So the pages in, in, in the brain section of the book were by far the most difficult. How to, in some cases, make the diagrams, which are the most logical way to communicate some of this stuff, but not look like diagrams. How to make them playful, but not make them silly. You know, that, that was definitely the most difficult. The easiest, on the other hand, was the digestive system, because it's just a great trip. I mean, the digestive system has been well done over the years, but when you journey down the alimentary canal, you are, with flashlight or without flashlight in hand, um, there are wonderful landscapes along the way. So I drew a lot of landscapes. When you get inside the small intestine, for instance, and begin to get closer and closer to the surface of the inside of that tube, it's miraculous. And it's just, it's all about having as much acreage as possible to absorb as many of the nutrients as possible as stuff passes through it. When you start something that you know nothing about, you have to basically beg everyone around you who knows anything to be generous with their knowledge. And I uh, went to the University of Massachusetts in Worcester and became good friends with an anatomy professor there who um, not only allowed me into her class, but we went into the lab after class with these med students. And you know, I stood there with my coat on and my gloves on watching students at nine tables work on different cadavers as they began exploring after the lesson, you know, after the class upstairs. And I went back, you know, I did that for a whole semester. You, you might think you're going to get squeamish about it, but um, it's, the, for the most part, they are so removed from life, these just collections of organs and systems and stuff like that, that you don't really, you don't really think that way. It's only difficult if you happen to sort of inadvertently walk past the end of a table and notice a face or an expression or an eye or something like that, and you think, you are reminded that it's not just a machine. It's not just a machine that's run out of juice. It's actually, it was the house. It was the home of this personality, this, you know, this, this individual whom we don't know. Uh, and I think that's why the faces tend to be covered for as long in the process as they are, to minimize that, uh, that, that sort of distraction. But in terms of queasiness, I went to some operations. I watched pancreases being removed um, and, a, and a knee replaced and things of that nature. And you, it's so fascinating that you forget to be queasy. You forget to think of it that way at all. The only odd thing was in the, in the, in the operation, um, one of the operations in particular that went on for seven hours, you know, they cauterize all the blood vessels as they're, as they're working. And it's a very long process to prepare the, the body to be able to remove whatever the organ is that has to come out. Uh, but because they're cauterizing blood vessels, um, they're burning them. And it smells like a barbecue. So I was incredibly hungry um, in this whole, and, and I couldn't figure out why after three hours I was starving. And I realized, like the 4th of July in here. What, what is going on? I, when I produce a book like this, I hope that it's going to have some sort of impact out there, some effect. I hope with this book that it's going to sort of foster an appreciation of the body as much as it does any understanding. I mean, for myself, I do think about those aches and pains a little bit more because I have a picture now of what's maybe creating the egg. What's rubbing against what? Which I didn't really have clearly. Just know it's a joint. What is the joint? The joint is so complicated, whether it's elbow, whatever. They are so complex in and of themselves and so beautifully designed. And once you have that picture in your head, you, you, know, you think about what might be causing the problem and then you think about how might be the best way to alleviate that problem. So I, I am more aware of myself physically. I get a little more exercise than I used to. And that's not easy when you're spending basically seven days a week at the drawing board for a couple of years. Uh, that's, it's very uncomfortable, actually. So uh, getting exercise, some kind of regular exercise, having the bike in the studio so that I can go over to it and, and um, work up a sweat for 30 minutes and then go back to the drawing board if I can walk, um, is it's really important. It's just a general awareness. Um, do I 
eat more carefully than I used to eat, I probably consume less M&Ms, for instance, than I used to. I've cut it down to maybe two or three pounds a week from what it might have been, let's say, um, a few years back.